Well, it gives me now great pleasure, great pleasure indeed, to introduce our final speaker. Lord Hodge is the Deputy President of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. I think he's had some experience of the Scottish tribunal system. Patrick, Lord Hodge, I now invite you to make your contribution. Thank you. Well, it's an honour to be able to address you briefly this afternoon at this important event. I'm very grateful to my old friend, Lord Woolman, for giving me the opportunity to share some thoughts with you, uh, and if there is time, to hear your views on how we can capitalise on the experience of the last 18 months to improve the service which tribunals give to our fellow citizens. I first became involved in the work of the modern tribunal system as an outer house judge when I was asked to be the Scottish UK tribunal liaison judge with the remit of working with Lord Justice Carnmouth, as he then was, who uh, as senior president of UK tribunals, initially senior president designate and then senior president formally, had been charged with setting up and then administering the new tribunal system. I recall reading with great interest the report by Sir Andrew Leggett entitled Tribunals for Users, One System, One Service, which was published in March 2001 and provided in large measure the blueprint for the government white paper, which in turn uh, revealed the modernizing influence of Lord Justice Henry Brooke, who was charged with uh, implementing and modernizing uh, the judicial system and it eventually became the Courts, Tribunals and Enforcement Act 2007. In essence, so far as today's discussions are relevant, what Sir Andrew sought to achieve was firstly a tribunal system independent of ministers, other public authorities and other parties. Secondly, a more coherent system by which the citizen could be presented with a single overarching structure giving access to tribunals. Thirdly, a more user-friendly system so that tribunal users would be able to prepare and present cases themselves and an enabling approach by tribunal members and the tribunal service. Fourthly, and importantly, active case management to achieve the timely determination of disputes. And fifthly, and finally, a coherent system of appeals in place of what Lord Wolfe once described as a hotchpotch. The report, of course, covered many other detailed to topics, but that quintet seems to me to be the essence of what was then, uh, the, what were then the proposed reforms. I also had the pleasure of being a member of the Upper Tribunal Tax, uh, uh, tax Chamber and, and recall a hearing involving the estate of Whittingham in East Lothian which belonged to the late Earl of Balfour, from whom I'd acted previously in the House of Lords when he sought successfully to break the entail on his estate, which his uh, uh, ancestor, uh, the first Earl of Balfour, Arthur Balfour, the Prime Minister, had put on the estate. And this was in order to leave it uh, to his favorite nephew. The House of Lords case was the one and only case about that particular se that section of an, an Entail Amendment Act passed in 1848, which ever reached the courts. Because of that experience, I had to declare an interest to the parties in the upper tribunal, including the revenue. The revenue didn't object as the case uh, in which I'd acted had nothing to do with the tax point that was an issue. And in any event, the revenue knew me well because I'd acted as their standing junior and in other cases for them during my career. So I'd form on each side and was able to uh, appear in the upper tribunal. And it was a, an excellent experience. My third involvement with the tribunal system was, was when I was an outer house administrative judge. I had had only um, occasional experience of immigration judicial reviews. And I remember only too well the difficulty as a judge of handling such judicial reviews only very rarely. This had the result that each time uh, one heard a case, one had to start from scratch because the legislation and the immigration rules were changing so rapidly. It was easy to feel seriously out of your depth. So 
In my capacity as administrative judge, I arranged a system by which five colleagues could sit every year for a fortnight in Field House in London to get regular and updated experience of immigration appeals. I hope that that system is still in operation. There is no doubt that one obvious benefit of a system of specialist tribunals is the specialization that the system facilitates. My colleagues in the Supreme Court have stated more than once that appellate courts must show respect for the expertise of specialist tribunals when considering their judgments on appeal, as for example, in the famous words of Lady Hill in A.H. Sudan, when speaking of the then Asylum and Immigration Tribunal. She advised, and I quote, that the ordinary courts should approach appeals from them with an appropriate degree of caution. It is probable that in understanding and applying the law in their specialist field, the tribunal will have got it right. Their decisions should be respected unless it is quite clear that they have misdirected themselves in law. That deference does not, of course, exclude effective judicial scrutiny of the lawfulness and fairness of decision-making in expert tribunals, but it involves a recognition of the value of uh, the expertise of those tribunals and their ability to produce a coherent body of specialist law, a point which Lord Hope made in Jones and the First Year Tribunal. The range of tribunal work is prodigious. A brief examination of the Tribunal Operations Review of October 2020 reveals that range. And I recognize that different tribunals have radically different subject matters of varying complexity. But across the, this range of work, the task has been and remains first, the facilitation of access to justice, as the previous speaker indicated. Secondly, the conduct of fair hearings for the determination of citizens' claims. And thirdly, transparency, so that justice is not only done, but is seen to be done. As the Lord President said in his keynote speech this morning, the last 18 months have posed a serious challenge to the justice system as a whole, from which the tribunal system has not been immune. But we have, I believe, risen to the challenge to maintain as far as possible continuity in the services which we provide. In my court, we were very fortunate to have a dedicated IT team and broadcasting team, which were able to put in place the first virtual Supreme Court hearing on the 24th of March, 2020, the day after the Prime Minister announced the first lockdown in England and Wales. I recall feeling rather nervous as I introduced the hearing live, not knowing whether there would be a very public breakdown of the system as there had only been the briefest of rehearsals with counsel immediately before the hearing commenced. But it worked. And between March 2020 and mid-July this year, the court conducted hearings remotely before returning to the building on an experimental basis in the last week of the legal year, last weeks of the legal year in July. Likewise, the tribunal system in Scotland, as in other parts of the United Kingdom, has done an excellent job in providing continuity of service in the most challenging of circumstances. The use of remote hearings, the production of electronic documents and many other initiatives have changed the way in which justice can be and is delivered in Scotland and more widely in the United Kingdom. There is a real opportunity to preserve the, those changes which have been beneficial to the administration of justice and which have been cost saving without compromising the quality of justice which the system provides. As this conference draws to its close, may I give you a challenge? And that is not just to preserve what is good about our response to the COVID crisis and also to use our newly acquired skills, or in my case, to perhaps a somewhat lesser extent, uh, 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 an acquired skill. Uh, those are the skills of judges and tribunals officials as a springboard for radical reform. The Lord President has spoken of three principles of access to justice, fairness, and transparency, and of the need to use resources 
in a proportionate manner in the administration of justice. In my view, there is great scope for the use of technology to enhance the delivery of the first of those principles, access to justice. Some tribunals hear cases of great legal and factual complexity and sometimes involving claims of very substantial value, which en end up in my court, particularly if they are large tax cases. Others provide justice in less complex areas of law in relation to claims of much more modest value. Remote hearings, electronic documents, and a sympathetic judiciary can assist the unrepresented citizen to, to advance his or her case before the tribunal at a proportionate cost. But the proper handling of claims often needs legal knowledge, and for many, the cost of legal representation is unaffordable and may in any event be disproportionate in the context of small value claims. So what can we do? One model, which uh, I've taken an interest in, is the online solutions court, which my colleague Lord Briggs and his team in the civil court structure review of 2015, 2016 in England and Wales recommended as a future model. This, it was proposed for claims with a value of less than 25,000 pounds and involved a three-stage process which in large measure dispensed with legal representation. The first stage involved an online investigation stage at which software, uh, which involved uh, sets of sequential screens, which were free of legal jar jargon, teased out the relevant components of a party's claim or defense. This was designed to allow the parties to identify what their legal case is and it provides a facility for the parties to upload their main evidence in the form of documents and statements. The second stage in involved not a judge, but a legally qualified case officer who selects the most appropriate means of resolving the dispute. This may be by telephone or online mediation or third party resolution, including early neutral evaluation by a district judge to hearing center. Stage three arises if resolution cannot be achieved at stage two. In that event, the dispute will be determined by a judge either online, by telephone, by video or face to face. And there will be a test of proportionality and a party must justify the more expensive forms of resolution. I see no reason why tribunals which, which have a jurisdiction which could benefit from such a system should not experiment with a model broadly along those lines. I was encouraged when the government promoted the Courts and Tribunals Online Procedure Bill, or inevitably uh, an acronym is developed, in this case CTOP, in 2019. CTOP was debated in the House of Lords in early summer but didn't complete its passage through the House of Commons in July before the parliamentary session ended. As a result, the bill fell. And this was, I think, a great pity. CTOP had much to offer and could readily have been adapted to address the concerns which had been raised in parliamentary debates. Rigorous pilot schemes could address the argument raised in, par in Parliament that we were moving too far too fast and also preserving the option of a traditional hearing uh, to accommodate the, di the digitally excluded could meet concerns for such litigants as were expressed. I hope that CTOP will be revived notwithstanding the financial constraints under which the UK government will be operating in the post-pandemic world. And I do hope that the Scottish government might have a look at this initiative, both for the tribunal system and the court system in Scotland, uh, as it may be an important initiative and means of giving people who cannot afford legal representation access to justice. I think we must lift our eyes to the opportunities that IT gives us to improve access to justice by digital means. In a lecture at uh, UCL earlier this year, 
Professor Rabinovich Aini described the development of online dispute resolution internationally. She explained how eBay had developed a system of ODR, which handles 70 million disputes per year, of which 90% are resolved without the involvement of a human third party. She spoke about court initiatives in England, the Netherlands, Canada, China, Singapore, and elsewhere. And she described the use in the United States of courts, uh, in the United States court systems of private sector software organizations such as Modria Tyler and Matterhorn, a cloud-based platform operated by Court Innovations Incorporated to provide online dispute resolution in civil and family cases and traffic offenses. And she spoke of the prospect of the use of AI to determine many other disputes. There is, I think, much that can be done through the use of online dispute resolution to give people access to justice. And it will be a wasted opportunity at a time when the courts and tribunal systems have adapted to technological change and a crisis if we were not to use that disruption as a springboard for further and more radical reform. In the time that remains, I look forward to hearing any suggestions which you may have in this regard. Thank you.